today. Inside is supposed to be a copy of the Lexham English Septuagint by Lexham Press. And we'll open it. See if I can do it without letting any blood. We'll take a look to see what we have inside. some packaging and the book itself comes in a plastic wrap it appears to be cloth over board white page edges I would guess looking at that that that's a glued binding but I don't want to make any assumptions We'll examine that thoroughly when we do the review later. This week we'll be reviewing the Lexham English Septuagint. For those of you who don't know, the Septuagint is an ancient translation of the Bible into Greek, the Old Testament. The Lexham English Septuagint comes with a sheet that gives you a bit of information on the back and a short bio of Ken Penner. And here is the ISBN and the list price. The volume is nine and a quarter inches tall, six and a quarter inches wide, and it's one and seven sixteenths inches thick. And you can see there is no guilting. It is um, compared to other books, say the other modern language translation, the Septuagint, that's widely available, the NETS, New English Translation of the Septuagint. It's a bit thicker and not quite as wide. The NETS is a two-column paragraph-by-paragraph format translation of Septuagint. The Lexham English Septuagint is in a single-column format. As you see here, that column is 101 millimeters wide. I count about 76 characters on a closely spaced line. That is, with the characters fairly uh, close to each other, not much white space showing. There are as many as 49 lines of text in the column. The page dimensions are 228 millimeters tall, 151 millimeters wide. Get my pointer here. That's 8.98 inches tall, essentially 9 inches tall, and 5.95 uh, inches wide, or about 6 inches wide. The print is black to dark gray, so there is some non-uniformity, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. It is line matched. Let's see if I can show you that easily. And you should be able to see the text on the opposite page. Let's see if we can amplify the effect for you. So the print from the opposite line on the opposite page should be overlaying the print on this side. And it does. Margins, uh, some of them are generous. Margins at the top of the page, I count from the top of a capital to the edge, are 21 millimeters. Remember there are 25.4 millimeters in an inch. At the bottom is about 17. I normally count from the, the bottom of a descender. So from the bottom of a descender here in the line to the edge is about 17 millimeters. The inner margin can be as much as 15 millimeters, and the outer is about 32 to 35 millimeters. So that's generous and useful for line taking. The problem is that the inner margin is quite small, which causes the text to curve a bit into the gutter. The uh, font, uppercase, when compared to Times New Roman, those characters are about 9 points. The E is more like, in size, about a 9.5 point Times New Roman. The line height is generous, as it generally is for the single column Bibles, because the eye needs, uh, needs room in which to relax as it scans all the way across the page. 
line height is 3.9 millimeters. That's equivalent to 11 points. There are verse numbers within the paragraphs, as you see here. They are fairly easy to find. Um, there are no italic words here, so words that the translators supply for smoothness are not added in italics. You will not find um, capitalized pronouns for deity, and I prefer that. There are often uh, translation notes at the bottom of the page, as you see here. Those translation notes are in a font that's about six to six and a half points tall. It's fairly sharp, although it is very small. Um, they're mostly translation notes, and you will often see the abbreviation HB, and that stands for Hebrew Bible. Let's see if we can find a usage of that here. Oh, here we go. So, 3-2 begins here in HB. HB means Hebrew Bible. Let's talk a bit about the paper. The uh, sheet thickness is 38.6 micrometers. I estimate the paper weight at about 35 GSM. The um, paper does have a sheen to it. Let's see if we can show that. Maybe I can get it at an angle. Yeah, there you're seeing some sheen too from the higher lamp. Um, it's sort of a patterned waxiness. It's not uh, even, so you'll get kind of a, some places where it's shinier than others. The um, paper is white with a faint gray tinge, and the show through I think is acceptable. Here you're seeing a heading from the other side of the page, and that really is not very bothersome. If we go to the front, you can see from the title page, like some English written, you're looking through the half leaf. So you get that much attenuation from the paper. I think that's quite good. So I call the show through acceptable. There is some print on uniformity. I mentioned earlier that the characters sometimes seem dark gray. Sometimes they're much blacker. So here are two pages side by side as I can get them easily. And see how much darker the ink is on the right page. Uh, the page to the right is page 175, compared to that on the left, 173. That's about as extreme as the variation gets from there to there. There are no book introductions. You just move immediately from one book of the Bible to another. So here's the end of Leviticus and the beginning of Numbers. Book titles are generally, except for the beginning page, are generally on the outside top of the page. Page contents are right beside the book title, so 214 should be the last verse on the right hand side page, and 123 should be the first verse on the left hand side page. First verse to begin on that page, and it is. Page numbers are right next to the book title and the contents. There are headings, as we've seen, they're in the outer margin. They're in a font that's about seven and a half to eight points, and it's italic. Chapter numbers, as you see here, are large and bold. They pan about, span about two lines of text. And uh, as far as I can tell, each book of the Bible begins on a separate page. Even the Minor Prophets do. So here's Zechariah. Zechariah begins on its own page. Haggai begins on its own page. This is Habakkuk. Nahum. So I believe that's pretty much uh, true throughout. We're seeing a lot of the sheen right now. The, uh, the book ends on page 1482 in an alternate translation of Bell and the Dragon, which is often included in Daniel. There's one sheet of thin paper after that, two sheets of cardstock, 
and it's a normal hardback binding. Uh, no pattern here, just white paper, cloth over board. There is a pattern, so you have gold um, boundary edges, pattern on the spine. As you can see, illustrated fairly well. It says 70 here for the Septuagint. There are uh, gold and gray head and tail bands. And you should be able to see the glue line here. There is no evidence of uh, stitching. So I'm quite confident this is a glued hardback. Uh, however, it does lie open fairly easily. So here we are in Genesis. This is Genesis 16. This is Genesis 2 and 3. Beginning of Genesis 1. It lies open. Pages are not so wide that it's uh, hard to manipulate. You can easily flip from one pa uh, place in the book to another, and because the book titles are near the outside edge, it's very easy to navigate and find your way around. Towards the center of the book, you do have some curvature down into the spine, so if you have a high magnification in your reading lenses, that could cause you a little trouble as the text warps down into the uh, center there. And uh, I think perhaps it would have been better to have moved maybe 10 millimeters of this outside margin into the inside margin so you don't have quite a steep of a slope here. But you can deal with that by putting something under one side or the other to flatten the page for you. In the front, We have the cardstock again. We have the half leaf, the title page, copyright page, copyright 2019 Lexham Press. Here is the ISBN for the print and an ISBN for digital, Library of Congress number, identifying some of the personnel involved. Typesetting is by Scribe Inc. Here is the table of contents, and those of you who are familiar with the Septuagint will notice it's a, a unique ordering, certainly different from what we've seen in the NETS. And of course it's uh, because it's based on what Sweet did in the Cambridge Septuagint from the 1890s, so they follow that order. We'll look at the uh, contents in more detail on a slide later on. Acknowledgements. And then we move on to the introduction, and we'll look at the introduction a bit in just a moment, in some detail in places. And then you have um, a bibliography, essentially, Septuagint resources. And you move on to Genesis from there. Let's take a closer look at the introduction. We're on, on page Roman at 10 of the introduction here. They say that the Lexham English Septuagint is the only contemporary English translation of the Septuagint that has been made directly from the Greek. They then add, farther down the page, uh, that there are two major styles, types of editions of original language texts, eclectic and diplomatic, they explain to you what an eclectic text is. Then, uh, on the right-hand page, we are informed that um, a diplomatic edition is an edition of orig an original language text of a single manuscript in its entirety, supplemented from other manuscripts only when content is missing. This particular one is from Sweet's Septuagint. I think the first volume, this is a three volume set. First volume was printed in about 1894. It's a diplomatic edition of Codex Vaticanus, which is also called B. Um, where Vaticanus is missing material, the text comes from Alexandrinus and Sinaiticus. We'll see a place in just a moment where it uh, is using the Alexandrinus text quite clearly in Genesis. Then um, 
the next paragraph down is a statement that I found quite encouraging when I read it. Um, in the case of the LES, the, this means the point of reference is the person reading the Greek manuscript rather than the person translating from Hebrew into Greek. The LES has in mind the translation not as produced but as received. It seeks to replicate in English the same sort of reading experience that an ancient Greek speaker would have had when reading the Septuagint in Codex Vaticanus. So we'll look at a few passages. I've only had this for less than two weeks, so I haven't uh, studied it thoroughly, but I have spot checked it in a few places, and we'll take a look at a few of those. As we continue through the introduction, we see a section on the history of the translation, the principles of translation, vocabulary. Here in the principles, they make the point that the English translation should feel idiomatic where the Greek is idiomatic. So they're trying to give you the experience of the Greek in English. Um, Guided by the principle that if the Greek is smooth and represents good Greek style, the English should convey that style. The English should be awkward if the Greek is awkward. And um, a bit about gender. And generally I like what they have to say over here about gender issues. Something about proper names. And this is one of the significant differences between this edition and the New English translation of the Septuagint. And then in conclusion, and the names of the editors. So this is fairly recent. This is uh, written in July of 2019. You're looking now at uh, Deuteronomy 23. Um, I had a comment in a different video this past week about the uh, Lexham English Septuagint. And the commenter pointed out to me that uh, verse 2 in uh, Deuteronomy 23 was missing. As you see here, you began with verse 1, and then there's verse 3. So what's going on? My initial reaction, uh, turns out to be correct, was that um, it's absent here because it's absent in the source text. As you can see in this chart, this is uh, an image from Sweet's, uh, Volume 1 of Sweet's Septuagint. You have verse 1, and then you have verse 3. So what happened to verse 2? Well, if you look at Sweet's apparatus down below, where I have it in red underlining, you see that that verse um, is mentioned as being present in other sources, but omitted in B, the B with the asterisk there after the letters O-M. That's the original reading of Vaticanus. So Sweet did not follow it. If you're curious about how that verse re actually reads, here is uh, Deuteronomy 23 in the NETS. And so what uh, Vaticanus admits is, one from a prostitute shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. In this section of the video, we'll do some font comparisons. The Lexham English Septuagint on, is on the left, and on the right is a large format, an English-only edition of Brenton's Septuagint, available from lulu.com. And uh, Brenton's is clearly a larger font, and also on this particular page it appears to be printed much more boldly. Uh, unfortunately, this large format Brenton Septuagint is um, a glued paperback. Now on the uh, right I'm showing the normal format Brenton. This is the Hendrickson's edition of Brenton that has both English and Greek. Um, the font is much, uh, much smaller. In fact, it's uh, hard for someone with old eyes like mine to use it. So, um, just in terms of usability, the one on the left is much easier. Of course, it's nice having the Greek right there with the English. As now on the right, I have uh, the New English translation of the Septuagint. Of course, the Lexham English Septuagint is still on the left. As you can see, the font on the left is uh, larger, and the line spacing is more generous. So on the right, you have a feeling of being crowded, not quite as bad as in the, as in the Hendrickson uh, Septuagint, Hendrickson's ed edition of Brenton, but it still does make you um, 
makes me feel more claustrophobic. The one on the left is certainly more uh, friendly to the reader. Although myself, I prefer the two column format on the right, just as uh, an aid to someone shopping for modern language editions of the Septuagint. I prepared this chart in terms of dimensions. You see the key differences are that the uh, LES is thicker and the NETS is a wider volume. The uh, NETS has two columns, each 65 millimeters wide, while the NETS has a single column, 101 millimeters wide. Uh, NETS has only 52 characters per column, but it has two columns per page, so each line has 104 characters. Um, to compared to contrasted to 76 or so in the LES. Lines per page, much more in the NETS. That gives you that feeling that you're uh, you're crowded again versus the more relaxed 49 in the LES. Margins, the TBIO that you see there, top, bottom, inside, and outside. And you have the relatively wide outside margin, 35 there in the LES font size. Generally speaking, the LES is about half a point larger, and that does make a difference. And then the line height. With uh, the double column format, generally you'll see a lower number for line height than a comparable single column edition, and that's because of eye discipline or lack thereof. They have to give you more space so that your eye can thread the needle all the way across the page. Um, the uh, bold, the NETS has a font that's less bold. It looks thinner than the LES, and to my eye, that is another advantage for the LES. I like a bolder font. Paperweight, they are uh, comparable. My estimate is that the NETS is a heavier paper. They both have some waxiness and some sheen to them, but I think the NETS has less sheen than the LES does. Both have uh, decent levels of ghosting. I think ghosting is worse on the LES. Certainly acceptable, but I think it's worse uh, because that there is more ink used on a page. The characters are bolder. The cover on the NETS is a slick hardback. It's uh, has this uh, printing, printing on it. And uh, we have a cloth overboard. I prefer the cloth overboard. Um, NETS has a big advantage in that it's a glued binding, and you can clearly see the signatures there. Um, the NETS has the advantage that it's a sewn binding. The LES is, uh, is glued. And then if we look at the basis of the translation, the NETS is an eclectic uh, translation of the Gottingen Septuagint or where that's not available from Rolf's. So it's using multiple extant manuscripts, whereas Sweets is a diplomatic edition of Vaticanus, and we've seen at least one instance where that means that you lose some text. This uh, slide shows a few other differences. The NETS, as, as we mentioned earlier, contains book introductions, while the LES does not. The NETS transliterates names, which a lot of readers find awkward. Personally, I don't. But um, the LES gives them in, the, in a way that's more familiar to the reader. They use Joshua instead of uh, Jesus. The NETS and the LES order um, the books of the LES and the Septuagint differently. We'll see that in the next chart. The NETS and the LES do not include the same books. Um, there are a couple of differences we'll see. The NETS offers more translations based on alternate source texts. All that will be on the very next chart we see. And then the final point, we'll take a look at Proverbs 24 and 30 in the two different translations. So here are the contents compared. You see the books in blue are the same, same books in the same order. And then things start shifting around. So Esther, Judith, and Tobit are moved later in the LES than they are in the NETS. The four books of Maccabees are moved to the very near the very end in LES, where they're much closer to the front in NETS. See the wisdom books there in gray are 
right after the initial 16 books in blue in the LES. And um, then you notice that the NETS has the Prayer of Manassas, which is not explicitly in the LES. On the other hand, it is in the Book of Odes, which is not in the NETS. But the NETS actually includes all the material from the Book of Odes. It just doesn't pull it out and place it in a separate book. Then uh, one major difference is the Book of Enoch. It's not the complete full Book of Enoch that you'll find translated from Ethiopian sources, uh, but it is what Sweet decided to include in his edition based on Greek sources. We'll take a closer look at that later. Now, uh, Vaticanus doesn't actually include the material below that line in the third column on the right. So the four books of Maccabees, the Psalms of Solomon, Edic, Odes, and so forth are not included there. Um, so where did they come from? Well, I looked in the, the introduction to the third volume of Sweet Septuagint, and he says there that for the books of the Maccabees, he has used uh, Codex Alexandrinus. And um, then he goes on to say that the Psalms of Solomon are um, from, they were, they were one time followed the New Testament in Codex Alexandrinus and are found in several cursive manuscripts of the wisdom books. The Book of Enoch is important, he says, and so he includes it here even though it's not actually a Septuagint book. Uh, the Odes are printed as they appear at the end of the Psalter of Codex Alexandrinus. I mentioned earlier that sometimes uh, the NETS and the LES number the uh, chapters and verses differently, and Proverbs particularly is a good example. Here you are, Proverbs 24, 24, Fear my words, son, and when you receive them, repent, in the LES. That is actually uh, chapter 30, verse 1 and the NATS. Then NATS follows chapter 30 verses 1 through 14 with 24, 23. Now these things I say to you who are wise that you know them. But that is 24 verse 38 and the Elias. And I say these things to you who are wise for you to recognize them. 2450 in the LES, the leech had three daughters, loved with love. That is uh, 30 verse 15 in the um, NETS. I'd like to show a few comparisons now between the NETS and the LES. And I'll start with this rather famous passage in Proverbs chapter 8 verses 22 through 25. Here you see the NETS on the left and the LES on the right, so you can pause and read the two side by side if you like. The point I want to make is that the meaning of this passage, um, understood to refer to the Logos, was contested in the 4th century. The Arians, those who believe that uh, the Son of God was a created being, attempted to use it to prove that that was true. Uh, the word the LES translates at the end there, which I have in blue produced, is actually the present tense verb gena, which comes from genao, uh, often translated as begat or became the father of. The Nicene Creed affirms that the son was begotten, not made or produced. So you see there LES uh, has he produced me at the end while the NETS, I think, uh, has a superior translation, he begets me. If you look early in the verse, and this is just um, for historical purposes, it says the Lord created me, and that creates problems, at least it did for the Orthodox at the time. Uh, so if wisdom is the Son, that is the Logos, the, does the verse actually cre uh, teach that he was a created being? I've included here uh, Gregory of Nyssa's explanation for why that's not so and why it creates uh, difficulties if it's interpreted that way. Uh, in the next line, um, the NETS has before the present age, while 
the Elias has before eternity. Both are translating pra to eonos. Uh, they both agree with the lexicons. Um, N-E-T-S inserts the word present before age, and present is not present in the Greek, but I think before the age would have been awkward. We're looking now at Genesis 6. We'll focus in on uh, verses 1 through 2. In this first chart, I just wanted to uh, give the introduction to the LES, uh, its explanation on gender, gender neutrality and the explanation of um, anthropoi as, or anthropy as um, humans. So I'll let you read that and then we'll go on to the next point which is uh, one related to the peculiarities of being reliant upon a single manuscript as, uh, as your source document. So this is a diplomatic translation of the of Vaticanus, but Vaticanus is not, not extant uh, until Genesis uh, 4628. Earlier uh, we're translating Codex Alexandrinus and here Codex Alexandrinus has angels of God rather than sons of God. Now there's some controversy about whether the sons of God were angels and Alexandrinus removes that altogether and uses the word angels. Um, the final point I want to make here is uh, the LES seems to be a bit informal at the end of verse 2, where it says picked out rather than chose. Um, you know, perhaps there is something in the original Greek that leads you to believe that the Greek is very informal there, but I don't see it. And I would, uh, would have preferred um, choose over picked out. You're looking now at uh, Psalm 3, verse 6. In the LES it reads, I went to bed and fell asleep. I awoke because the Lord will help me. It reads a bit differently in the NETS. And my, I wonder which one of these translation would, would uh, bring to your mind thoughts of Jesus' death and resurrection. I think the NETS does. Hippolyt Hippolytus understood this verse to refer to the fact of the Lord's sleep and rising again. And he connected it to Galatians 1.1, 1, 1. Uh, God the Father raised him from the dead. Uh, Irenaeus is even more clear. He wrote that the prophets spoke of his having slumbered and taken sleep, and, the, and of his having risen again, because the Lord sustained him, referring clearly to this verse. So I think an early Greek reader who's reading this in an allegorical way that they did in those days, would, um, you would represent, re reproduce that experience better with the translation on the left than on the right. Um, we're looking now at uh, Psalm 18.7. From the top of the heavens is its going out and its end is until the top of the, the heavens. So you see there's a typo here. Um, the early Christian readers of the Septuagint were trying to find Christ just about everywhere, and they often succeeded, and this was one of those verses that they succeeded in. Um, the LES seems to, by using its connect, the rising and the going down with the sun, which of course is the literal meaning, but to get the experience of the early Christians who were reading this in Greek, I actually think that the NETS does a better job. Uh, when the psalmist expressed himself in this way, he announced that very truth of his being, that is, the Lord's being, the Lord's being taken up again to the place from which he came down, and that there is no one who can escape his righteous judgment. That's the way Irenaeus understood it in Against Heresies. I think it's easy to interpret the NETS this way if we read heaven for sky, but I don't think it's that easy to interpret the LES that way. As I mentioned, the Christians in the early centuries who were reading the Septuagint uh, attempted to find Christ throughout it. One of the verses where they succeeded in their own minds, at least, is here in Isaiah. 46.14. In particular, this portion of the verse, God is among you, 
is the way it reads in the um, Lexham English Septuagint. But uh, note that the pronoun you here is singular in this verse. So among you singular, I, I have difficulty wrapping my mind around that. Brenton, who employs the older English singular pronouns, correctly translates this as God is in thee. The L L By the way, the LES omits, they will say, that you see there in red, because it's absent from Vaticanus. I just say that as an aside. Now, why is this important? It was very important uh, to Cyril of Alexandria in terms of his uh, Christology. And I will just let you freeze this and read this. But at least, I think the quote there makes it very clear that Cyril of Alexandria was reading this as God is in you, that is, in Christ, in a singular way. Not God is among a single person or among a group of people. So I, I have no more comparison charts, uh, but I do want to show you a few passages. Uh, so here's the 23rd Psalm, which is the 22nd Psalm in the Septuagint. The Septuagint combines what um, in most modern English translations are the 9th and 10th Psalm into a single one. And so the numbers are lower at this point in the, in the series. But you can freeze that and read that if you please. Here is a passage from Ezekiel about the Valley of Dry Bones, so feel free to pause the video and uh, read this section. And finally, this is a sample from Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded because of our sins, and he became weakened because of our lawless acts. By his bruise we were healed. Now, in case you're curious about the alternate text translations at the back, we're looking now at the alternate text translation of Tobit. And it reads down here, this is a translation of Sweet's alternate version of Tobit. This is from Codex Sinaiticus. And then Daniel, the text, alternate text to Daniel, which is on the right here. Is actually Theodotion's translation. As you can see there at the note. This is a translation of Theodotion's Greek translation of Daniel. That's the one that actually was most widely used. We mentioned earlier that um, the Book of Enoch is included in the Elias, but it's only portions of it. This uh, translation here is uh, from the Greek text found in Codex Panopolitanus. And if you read the introduction to the uh, Nicholsburg uh, Vanderkam edition of Enoch, from this, which is translated from the Ethiopic, you see that roughly 25% of First Enoch has survived in two Greek manuscripts from the 4th and 5th to 6th centuries, chapters 1, 1 through 32, 6, and 97, 6 through 107, 3, and then two or th perhaps three fragments of other parts. In um, the LES, you do not see 97.6 through 107.3 that is not included, but there are two other fragments that are included. So you have 1.1 through 32.6 and then some other bits. And even there, it's not entire. If you look at chapter 3 in Nicholsburg, you get 3.1, uh, 4.1, and then 5.1. But here in the LES, you just have one line from three. Observe well and see all the trees. Contemplate and observe how all the trees appear. And you get all this material, and then you get to five one. Their leaves blossom green on them. And you move here in the LES immediately from observe well and see all the trees, how the trees are covering themselves in green leaves. So there is a a lacuna there. And then if you go later, here's the Book of Odes, so we went one page too far. You get to the end of 32, 32.6. 32, 6. 32 6 reads, in part, this is the tree of wisdom from which your father ate. And if you look here, 
32.6. In Nicholsburg it says, This is the tree of wisdom from what your father of old and your mother of old who were before you ate and learned wisdom. So a little different textually there as well. Then, uh, then after 32.6 you have um, 89, and the note here says the translation of Enoch 89, 42-49 is based on the Greek text of Vaticanus. And uh, it does map into what's in uh, Nicholsburg, verse 42. So it starts there in verse 42 in Nicholsburg and runs through the beginning of uh, 48. In fact, the dogs and foxes fled from it and feared in verse 49. And Nicholsburg is actually included here, verse 49 at the end. Then on the next page, you have a fragment that is not, to my knowledge, in the uh, Ethiopic. So this is something that you get here that you do not get in a modern Ethiopic translation of First Enoch. Uh, this text is a translation of a fragment of Enoch in Greek contained in the chronography of Georgius Syncellos. The material is not paralleled in the Ethiopic version of Enoch, hence its status as an inserted chapter. So you get a bit here that you do not get in the Ethiopic. Well, this has been a brief overview of the Lexham English Septuagint. Um, there are a lot of things I like about it, and a few things that I'm not sure whether I dislike. Uh, so or early yet in the evaluation process, that I really need a lot more data to have a good sense, but. I do like the cover. I prefer the cover here to the cover in the NETS. Um, I don't like the fact that the binding is glued. Uh, it does seem to handle well enough now, but I'm concerned long term about whether it will survive, whereas this text block is Smythe's own, and I have confidence in it. Um, I like the print and the layout. The only thing that I would have done differently is to move the center margin out and shrink the outer margin. But you may disagree, particularly if you want to be able to write. Since it's a single column format, you certainly have a lot of room to write and perhaps correct the translation here. Um, talked about uh, the, the paper. I think the paper is um, certainly adequate from a point of view of opacity, it's very good. And I like the fact that the text is line matched. I don't like the sheen on the paper, but I can always adjust the uh, angle of my lamps to avoid that. My biggest concern with it is that it doesn't do what they said they wanted to do here in the introduction. When I read this, I actually was quite excited, um, but I hadn't examined it yet. The LES has in mind the translation not as produced, but as received. It seeks to replicate in English the same sort of reading experience that an ancient Greek speaker would have had when reading the Septuagint in Codex Vaticanus. And I think it may, it's too early to say, but based on the few comparisons I've made to date, it may actually fail in that because the translators didn't take into account the approach that the ancient Greek-speaking readers took to the Septuagint, which was to look for Christ in every single sentence, word, and character. So I think perhaps another, I say perhaps because I don't know for sure, but perhaps another revision of the LES should be undertaken in which um, all the patristic witnesses are taken into account and where they make an argument based on the text, based on a specific reading of the Septuagint, perhaps the text here should be modified to comport with the patristic understanding of the text. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this review, such as it is. If you have, please remember to like the video, and if you're inclined to do so, I would certainly appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. Thank you.